dumplings are being cooked in the kitchen, and as soon as they're ready, they'll be brought out to you. So before we get started, I just wanted to invite Heidi Taylor, who's the Artistic and Executive Director of Playwrights Theatre Center, up. Heidi? Hi. I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to come back That's a here good idea. and stand behind uh, our friends Bob and, and Derek here. So um, I think all of you are probably aware all of our work play takes place on the unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And um, one of the things that CTC is really interested in is uh, what all of these people are doing uh, right here in Vancouver. And there's some fantastic cultural activities that you can take part in. So uh, one of them is the City Before the City. It's an exhibit called Stefan. And it looks at the 5,000 year history of the Musqueam people on this land. And you can go to the uh, Museum of Vancouver and see all kinds of living history that uh, is animated by videos of um, artists who are working in the community, elders and cultural knowledge keepers. And it's a tremendous way to understand the, the land and the people who, whose place we're on. Um, the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation just had a walk to uh, raise funds for solar panels on October 30th, and you can keep in touch with the projects that they're uh, um, supporting on their Facebook page, which I is for the Tsleil-Waututh Sacred Trust, and that is at TWN Sacred Trust, Sacred Trust on Facebook. Um, very exciting, right in our own neighborhood, the new Strathcona Library Branch is going to be opening sometime soon. They say <laughs> end of 2006 or maybe the beginning of 2007. And you can find out how to pronounce the name of the Stratco new Strathcona branch, which is a mus Musqueam word, which means we are one. And I'm going to give it a try. It's Natsamat. So uh, let's all meet at Natsamat to meet, read books, learn about all of the cultures that are represented here in Strathcona. Um, and also, I'd like to mention um, a special event happening through the Heart of the City Festival, our wonderful partners on the event here, uh, the Survivors Totem Pole Raising, which is um, the gathering at Maynard Hastings. The, the procession will start at 12 noon this Saturday, November 5th, and uh, the, the totem pole will be raised in, in Pigeon Park. According to the Sacred Circle Society, who are leading the initiative, the poll honors the many people who have arrived and lived in the downtown east side as survivors. So um, it's a really um, incredible opportunity to take part in reconciliation uh, activities here in the downtown east side. So um, in recognizing the territories that we're uh, living on, I think it's a daily activity that we can all participate in, and it's, it's incredibly enriching to our own lives. So over to you, Melanie. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you very much. So folks, uh, what we're going to start with is we're going to start with uh, Derek Chan, and he is going to be doing a reading from a play by Shivani Tu called A Taste of Empire, which Derek has translated into Cantonese. He will be performing it in Cantonese, and our lovely vo volunteer, Curtis, will be operating uh, surtitles in Chinese and English on the screen so that you can follow along the play. So I am going to hand it over to you. Uh, so um, this is this is an excerpt of, of the the play that uh, we've translated and performed uh, in September down in Richmond. Um, so the story is that the character I play is the little sous chef, and we're supposed to be doing a demonstration cooking show. But the big masters are away on important business, so the little sous chef has to step up the plate and uh, and do a great job. And um, in this play, we um, will cook a dish uh, live uh, in front of the audience. It's a fish dish. It's a Filipino dish uh, called relleno bangus. It's um, so you hollow out the fish and then you stuff the fish. Um, and then previously in the play, we have named the fish bon bon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah. Ah. 麥斯姆大主話：失木魚係菲律賓其中一個國家象徵，對菲律賓人嚟講係好重要嘅食物。失木魚喺呂宋島北部林家賢灣有特別崇高嘅地位。
，而嗰度咁啱咧就係、是、我哋邦邦嘅出生地。林嘉賢灣最大嘅城市叫做達古潘，係菲律賓新木魚產量最高嘅城市。新木魚係達古潘幾百年來嘅經濟支柱。古時漁民撐船殺網去捉野生嘅新木魚，而嗰啲不畏勞碌嘅漁民咧就係、是、艾塔族人，達古潘傳奇嘅漁民。對艾塔人嚟講，捕魚唔止係揾食工具咁簡單。捕鱼系埃塔人生活嘅嘅嘅生活嘅一部分，系佢哋世代薪火相传嘅部落传统，祭祀天神、海神，感谢太阳赐俾佢哋温暖。只要跟随住风与浪嘅音乐同埋节拍，鱼群就会自然出现。啊，阿麦斯姆大柱话佢哋咁样捉鱼法咪戆居咯，手法又过时又低效率。啊，好在而家已经变为时间嘅遗物。时至今日。街市買到嘅新木魚，多數都係魚類孵化或者養殖場嘅產品。啊，開魚場係一個十分簡單嘅概念。哦，好似開間 club mat 咁，首先圍埋啲靚仔靚女一齊，男女共浴，跟住咧就隻眼開隻眼閉咁。啊，等佢哋自由混合一下，溝埋一齊，大家交下朋友。哦，到最後啊，一個唔覺意咪搞到大家都有曬餡咁咯。<笑>啊嗱，開魚場呢壇嘢歷史悠久。阿麦斯姆大主话：几千年前中美洲玛雅民族已经有，但系大概一百年前左右，养鱼业先至开始抛弃落后嘅手法同伟大嘅工业时代接轨。有远见嘅企业家意识到，如果喺渔场隔篱开间一万尺嘅加工场，啊，流水作业生产成本大量降低，嗱，而家间 club mat 就可以立即变为 super sandals。<笑>啊，我好耐冇放过假啊，其实。啊！話説回來，我哋阿邦邦咧係天下海鮮企業集團喺達古潘嗰間飲食業科技奇蹟、世界一流嘅失木與加工場嘅優質產品。啊，同埋咧就係喺呢間加工場裏面，我哋會見到邦邦上一個經手人。喺我之前最後一個接觸邦邦個雙手屬於呢位仁兄，佢叫做 Pia Ibasan。啊，阿 Pia 同邦邦一樣，都係喺達古潘出世。大概十年以嚟，佢喺天下海鮮打工，做初級檢查員。啊，其實阿 Pia 而家做海鮮呢行都唔出奇，因為佢祖宗十八代都係自豪嘅艾塔族魚翁。嗱、啊，你要明白喎、哦，艾塔人係一個非常倔強嘅民族，佢哋有自己做事嘅手法，冇嘢可以改變到佢哋。就連西班牙嘅殖民主義、亞美尼加嘅帝國主義，甚至乎大日本嘅佔領主義，都影響唔到艾塔民族。無論如何。艾塔人都要竭尽全力坚守部落传统，拒绝与时代并进、啊。但系我哋个 Pia 咧就唔同啦。十年前佢同佢老豆 Estar 讲话嗰啲祭天拜神嘢，老土迷信冇鬼用，要去加工场嗰度打工咁话、哦啊。好啦，咁我哋咧而家就喺鱼鳃后面轻轻咁切一刀，喺屋企整嗰阵可能会见少少血，咁系正常嘅。啊，正如阿师傅话斋，屌那声。唔见血又点算系帝国主义？<笑>啊！咁我哋而家咧就用把圆头抹刀，由个切口嗰度好小心咁样将帮帮啲皮同埋肉分开。啊！如果做得啱嘅话，应该可以好似挤牙膏咁圆条如新，连骨挤出嚟。啊！我谂当初阿 Pierre 话要背中气组拥抱工业化嘅时候，佢老豆 Estar 实听到腰心腰肺。啊！但系你谂下啦。阿老豆佢每日晨咁早开工，撑住只烂船十五个钟，杀网捞鱼冇停手，跟住上翻岸之后 ，Estar 仲要扶老携幼咁去卖翻啲鱼俾当地嘅铺头同埋餐厅。喂，就算阿 Pierre 同个老豆捉鱼捉到几叻都好，到最后都系要做 sales 咁四围频扑。啊，讲开又讲，我用紧嗰把 Maximo 牌至尊系列圆头抹刀真系几好用、啊。诶，弯身就手刀柄，高科技饭盒金刀身，柔韧耐用，永久保养。买菜刀，梗系买 Maximo <笑>啊！咁啊 ，Pierre 同佢家人就开档卖鱼咁啦。而千下海鲜开张之前，阿 Pierre 个衰鬼老豆咧，以前卖鱼就每公斤六毫，冇错，系六毫子。但系就算卖得咁贵，阿 Estar 一家都仲系要勒紧裤头。啊，而仲有咧，佢哋每日嘅渔获少过年烧捞金鱼。听讲话，就算成村人总动员捉极都好，都跟唔上成个林家贤湾嘅失木鱼需求。好在。多得天下海鮮企業集團，而家唔再需要靠翻艾塔族魚翁，啊有咗科學家、會計師同埋 MBA 團隊，大股本嘅未來有救咯
啊，天下海鮮企業集團專利嘅魚長生化監察系統，將達古般嘅失木魚產量提升一萬倍。而失木魚嘅市價咧，就由每公斤六毫下降至兩毫三仙。啊，餐廳同鋪頭嘅成本低咗，但係加實行賺個盆滿缽滿。而有批發投資查詢，請參考天下海鮮集團網頁。<笑>而而家嘅產量。天下海鮮唔單止能夠滿足到林家賢灣嘅需求，仲可以滿足到菲律賓全國嘅胃口，甚至乎批發出口到北美地區俾你哋食都冇問題。正如阿師傅話齋 ，Everybody's a winner <笑>。哎呀，除咗堅持搭沉船嗰啲，佢哋真係唔幫唔富貴咯。啊，係咁，好在多得 Pia 個娘親 Mira， 佢明白低抗潮流實在愚蠢，點都唔會俾佢個乖仔唔讀書去搭沉船捉魚。当佢乖仔做咗全村第一个中学毕业生嘅时候，阿 Mira 佢都唔知几骄傲。阿 Mira 曾经劝过其他艾塔人唔好同天下海鲜斗，可惜佢哋劝极都唔听。啊，如果佢哋醒少少，咪唔会搞到差唔多全村都英年早逝咯。咁<笑>好在 Mira 有远见，阿 Pierre 先至会嚟到我哋间世界级嘅加工场叹冷气打工做咗九年。虽然话冷气系为啲鱼而设，但系都算益到佢啦。啊！而阿 Pierre 嘅人工咧就每個星期都一樣，唔需要擔心被天氣或者魚獲影響。最重要咧，全因為喺天下海鮮打工，阿 Pierre 先至可以能夠提供到佢同埋佢老婆嘅生活質素。而阿 Pierre 只係需要每日企喺度八個鐘，確保急凍包裝送嚟我哋砧板上面之前咧，魚場撈翻嚟嘅魚符合基本安全食用標準啊，唔會做到好似落船捉魚咁腰酸骨痛。Thanks, Melanie.、Uh, well, in keeping、uh, with the theme of、uh, food and culture, I have a little short story that I wrote. But first, I thought I'd share、uh, an interesting tidbit about myself.、Um, I didn't fully realize I was Chinese until I was almost 25.、Um, now, obviously, I was aware of the fact. I couldn't not be aware. I mean, the signs were all there growing up. High academic achiever. Living in constant feel, fear of failure from an early age, <laughs> unbelievably overbearing mother, <laughs> and we didn't keep kosher, so I could reasonably deduce that I was in fact Chinese. But being Chinese never really seemed to matter until my mid twenties. Up to that point, I'd followed the regular life trajectory of a Chinese boy growing up in the seventies and eighties. I skipped a few grades because this was before they realized that this stunts your social development. I studied engineering because that's all what all my friends were doing, and eventually I joined the workforce. But about five years into a, a very mediocre engineering career, I decided that I wanted to be a professional actor. Best decision I ever made, and now I, I honestly can't imagine choosing another path. But back then, there was a price to pay for my newfound freedom. In the eyes of my peers and colleagues, I ceased to simply be a person, and I became a Chinese person. As awful and tedious as I found engineering, its one saving grace was the fact that it's more or less a meritocracy. None of my professors cared that I was Chinese, neither did any of my employers. In fact, you think about it, a lot of Chinese mom-approved professions are merit-based. Do you really care what race your neurosurgeon is? No, you just want to know that the person drilling into your skull knows what they're doing. <laughs> But acting is a very different animal. Acting was a real eye-opener. Because you don't get to define yourself in the theater and film word world, for the most part, other people are always defining you. So, if you're, for example, if you're overweight, you're appropriate for these roles and these roles only. If you're a beautiful young woman, I can cast you in these kind of roles until you turn 35 and the world doesn't care about you anymore. And if you're a 24-year-old Chinese man, these are your options. So that's when I had my awakening. I am Chinese. This is now the first thing my peers see about me. I thought I had many dimensions and qualities, but this apparently is now my primary dimension. My prospects and my aspirations are now very much informed by my ethnicity. Every performing artist of color has a similar awakening, and unless you have some very strong support systems, it can really play havoc on your psyche. The ones who survive are the ones who find strategies to define themselves. 
and who refused to let others do it for them. Part of my strategy was to embrace my Chinese identity without letting it define me as an artist. So I learned about my heritage in a way that I hadn't really thought about as an assimilated Chinese Canadian. I started to read about Chinese history and the history of the Chinese diaspora in North America. And as a playwright, I usually write plays with Chinese themes, not because I'm a one-trick pony, but for very pragmatic reasons. If I'm not adding to Chinese stories to the Canadian theater canon, then who's going to do it? All of this is a very long preamble to say that in my mid-20s, I became Chinese. And I navigated my way through life as a Chinese man until a few years ago when in my mid-40s, I went to a Hong Kong cafe and discovered that I'm not really Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Chung Chao is uh, an outlying island about 10 kilometers southwest of Hong Kong. It's like the Bowen Island of Hong Kong. And Chung Chao is typically where I stay when I'm working in Hong Kong because that's where my longtime collaborators live and they have a spare flat on the island. Uh, although Chung Chao is just a 45 minute ferry ride away from central Hong Kong, it's like a different world. Hong Kong is all glass, steel, and concrete jutting up towards the sky. Chung Chao is grass and trees and beaches. Hong Kong is power suits and high fashion. Chung Chao is definitely shorts and flip flops. Cars are prohibited on Chung Chao, so everyone bicycles. So when I think of Chung Chao, I think of the bikes, and I think of the smell of dried salt fish and shrimp. Above all, I think of the amazing cafes there. There are uh, Cha Chan Tang and Dai Pai Dong everywhere on the island. Now, I don't speak any Cantonese. My parents are from Manila, and our home dialect is Fukien. I speak a very modest amount of Mandarin, but virtually no Cantonese. And this has never been an impediment working in Hong Kong because anyone speaking only Chinese can get by in Hong Kong, very much a testament to its colonial past. But Chung Chao is completely different. Chung Chao is a blue collar fishing village that never had to cater to British overlords. So there are plenty of cafes where there's no one who speaks a word of English and the menus are all Chinese only. And one of these Chinese only cafes became my local hangout for seven weeks. Uh, Gold Hing was the name of the cafe, the only bit of English signage there. I think the Cantonese name of the place was uh, Gam Hing, so it got translated as Gold Hing. I didn't choose this place because of the food or the service, and I certainly didn't love being a functional illiterate there. <laughs> Gold Hing had two things going for it. It had outdoor tables with a great view of the harbor, and it was the only place within walking distance with Wi-Fi. <laughs> and so every morning I'd go to breakfast at Gold Hing with my laptop, I checked my mail, Skyped the office, uh, and suffer the indignity of being Gold King's least favorite customer. <laughs> uh, you know those heartwarming fish out of water stories where a foreigner shows up in a strange place and is adopted by the locals despite the fact he doesn't fit in? This isn't one of those stories. <laughs> um, I'm gonna hazard a guess that if I had been a blonde Nordic type, they might have taken me in. But the problem was, in their eyes, I should have been able to speak the language. And I tried, believe me, I tried. I, I would say, Josan every morning. And when I'd order, I'd say, uh, depending on which waitress I'd had, I'd either get a derisive snort or a tisk of disgust. <laughs> and how did I order? I used the point and uh, lega <laughs> method. There were basically 12 items on the menu and I'd cycle through them every day. But the problems, um, problem with the options, every time I ordered, I'd be offered like a choice. Do you want this or do you want that? <laughs> And every time I would stare like an idiot until the waitress just decided to pick for me. Now, I did learn one phrase. At about week number three, I figured out they were always asking me what to drink. So I'd always order the same thing, uh, which is my very poor attempt to say cold milk tea unsweetened. And the waitress, one, one waitress would actually get so mad at me because I was mispronouncing this so badly, so she would always correct me by repronouncing what I said louder <laughs> and slower. <laughs> the only other phrase I ever learned was uh, to ask for the bill. And to those of you who uh, don't look like me, I encourage you to le learn these phrases because they will love you over there. <laughs> so it wasn't until my final week in Cheng Chao in October that someone there attempted to speak some English to me. Uh, the owner, who was always at the cash register, said, you Korean? <laughs> and I shook my head and said, no, Chinese. And he said, mm, Chinese, you Korean? <laughs> <laughs> and once again said, no, me, I'm Chinese. And everyone in the cafe laughed, and the owner said, 
you're not Chinese. <laughs> um, I wanted to say goodbye to them, to say I was going home to Canada. I wish I'd had some way to thank them for feeding me for two months, but of course I lacked the words because I'm not really Chinese. And with that new information, I went home to Richmond. Just as a little postscript, I have ended up having to pass through Hong Kong two months later en route to China. So I visited my, uh, my good friends on Chung Chow, and out of habit, I guess I went back to Gold Hing for breakfast. I didn't even need to use Wi-Fi, I just went back for whatever reason. And for the first time, the wait staff who had never been particularly welcoming, they greeted me like an old friend. The, the surliest waitress who thought I was uh, a bit challenged brought me a cold, unsweetened milk tea, unprompted. So to them, I may not be Chinese, but at that point, I was at last a welcome guest. Thank you, Melanie, for um, greeting us all and taking care of the dumpling challenge and, and lowering microphones and doing all that. Um, I'd just like you to know that if you want more water for your tea, uh, just take the lid off. That usually works in many of the restaurants that I've been to. <laughs> and, uh, and someone will notice that and bring it. It looks like they're getting ready to serve the dumplings, and I dumplings can smell are on their way out. The dumplings are on their way out. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Derek again for doing that reading. Derek has written a wonderful essay about translating the play that we've posted on our website. And you'll find all, a lot about the language and a lot about Derek that you never thought you'd wanted to know. <laughs> and, um, and I'd like to make a note of Giovanni wrote the play in English. <coughs> Uh, originally, and I w uh, I'd like to start by asking you why you wanted it translated into Cantonese. Oh, um, well, it wasn't so much that it started like I needed it, I wanted it translated. I, I really had a strong desire to work with Derek um, to do a show at Gateway in Cantonese. So I r as I recall, like we had a, a meeting um, almost a year ago back in December, and we were just talking about, hey, you know, what are some plays you... Um, have wanted to do that were either written in Cantonese or that would be good for translating. And uh, we, we threw out a whole bunch of different titles and then I just, I guess at one point it dawned on me, hey, what about, you know, this, I think I asked you, you cook, right? Yeah, you do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I, yeah, I said, yeah, yeah, I can cook. Yeah. So that, that was really the, yeah, so it wasn't so much uh, born out of a desire to have this, like it never occurred to me to ha have the piece translated. It was really, I just, I really was dying to have Derek do something in Cantonese on our stage. And it just turned out that uh, it, you know, was my play in the end. So, yeah. Well, we'll talk some more about that in yeah. a bit. Um, um, Andrea, you may or may not know, has been recently, uh, besides being a producer and all, a, a director and just about everything there is, on a board of, of Vancouver Asian Canadian Theatre is also an actor, and I didn't know you were an actor before you were everything else. So, <laughs> But she was recently in a production of King of the Eve, and I'd like, uh, I heard some great stories from the people who were in that show that suggested that it was a really unique experience to be Asian actors and uh, together, yeah. and I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, well, I remember the first time we had um, a workshop read through and looking around the table, we all actually, all the actors and the, the team sort of, we knew each other, but we were never all in the same room together working on the same project. And it was such a, that was sort of a, a very, um, it, like a, a wonderful moment of like, oh, we're actually all together. Because usually the experience in theater I found is that there'll be one of me <laughs> and maybe maybe another Asian person and that's about it and generally there's not all that much diversity in a cast so um, but this was also like the first time 
I've ever experienced where my cultural background um, informed my work. Like a lot of times I'll go into a Shakespeare or I go into a modern play, but that doesn't take into consideration sort of um, how I was raised and um, even just certain cultural traditions that uh, I was raised with. And that was actually really interesting to have to access this sort of my, my Chinese history, my Chinese ancestry, um, and the culture that I was raised in, um, in the role itself. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm not really used to a role. Uh, generally, as a person of color, there aren't a lot of roles written for me in English. And Lauren was uh, an Asian American female <laughs> who was in her early 30s. And I'm an Asian Canadian female in my early 30s. So that was, um, that was a big first. And it was really delightful to work in that cast in that role. When you talk about your um, uh, your culture informing your work, um, yeah. uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Tell me a little more. Uh, even one is language. Having, I mean, I didn't have a lot of Cantonese, but like having to speak Cantonese again, it, it like there's um, something that almost happens in your brain, um, and just having, so I don't know, like even speaking Cantonese all of a sudden just reminds me of my family and the language of my family and there was something about access in that. And then there were like little points, um, even the dynamic between the father and the daughter. Um, oh yeah, so Giovanni played your father. Yeah, yeah, Giovanni played my father and this, that aspect of you, because Lauren is, is quite feisty and she's quite independent, but culturally like, uh, and, and this spans other cultures, but um, like I was very much raised like when you speak to your dad no matter how upset you are or whatever there's a certain level of respect and there's a line that you just don't cross and um, and I think that really informed how I spoke to Giovanni's character there was always this certain level of respect and respect for authority mm -hmm. so like little things like that that would inform the role you look like you wanted to jump in there oh, yes. no? okay. <laughs> um, Bob You've been spent many years caring very deeply about preservation of culture in Chinatown, and has, uh, has, and I was wondering if you thought, having seen, I think we saw both of these plays, um, that if you think that theater has anything to to bring to to the to help in that fight. Oh, most definitely, it's a, it's a it's a medium, which brings about the awareness of of my generation and subsequent generations about about expressing the pride of being Chinese, for me anyway. And I really think theater is such a king of the yous and, and festival empire, sorry. How, that, how it brings, how it brings mm -hmm. that out, or it brings it out, make it more appealing to the masses. But to me, it, it really, it's a great affirmation about being Chinese. And I really think theater is a very expressive way of doing that. Um, I was thinking about, did uh, you saw it in, in, in Cantonese, right? Yes. Um, did, did you ever see it in English? What? Uh, uh, um, Case, Case of, of Empire. Empire. No, well, first of all, uh, it was, in, in Cantonese, but English subtitles. Oh, right. Because I, I could never understand it as it was in Chinese. I, you know, because I'm third generation, and I do recall some words that were spoken, like a little semblance of it, but but the idea of having English subtitles really appealed to me. Yeah. I think it was really good. Yeah. Oh, me too. Yeah. So, Derek, mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about in when we were, while you were in the process of translating about this, that um, you've been studying writing in English for what, fourteen years? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you went back to um, Cantonese, mm. and uh, what was that like? It's. Uh, I think I've said that before. It, it's kind of like making up with a family member that you had a really big fight with. Uh, 14 odd years after. Uh, I remember, uh, some of you know this this story, when I first moved here I tried really hard to sound Canadian, to 
to behave like a Canadian. I would avoid speaking Cantonese and working in Cantonese. Um, but I don't know. Something just uh, uh, changed in the past year or so that um, that something changed in me that that I feel like it's it's a part of me that I can't get rid of and I should not get rid of it. Um, and yeah, it's um, it's a it's a nice feeling uh, in a way, uh, but it also feels a little bit like I'm making up for lost time, kind of. Uh, can you talk about that a little more? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, because when I first moved here, I, I, I really feel that, oh, I'm in someone else's country now. I got I to gotta speak the language. I got I to gotta be like one of them. And, and that's because otherwise I'm going to sound stupid. They're going to think I'm stupid. I'm not going to get any, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get any work here in, in, in Vancouver or, um, uh, and so on. Uh, but now that I'm here, uh, come to think of it, I, I think it's a bit of a silly thought really. Uh, and. Oh, I was recently doing a project that requires me to speak some of my lines with a Cantonese accent, and I was just lamenting to one of my my co-performers that oh, I don't, I honestly don't know where mine went, <laughs> um, and and not so much in a good way that oh, you you sound like you're from here. Uh, I used to be pretty proud of that when people tell me oh yeah, I, I didn't know you were uh, you, you spent 16 years in Hong Kong. I used to think oh yeah, great, I made it, <laughs> um, but. But now when I, when I hear that, I, I think, oh, great, I have the ability to do that. But then also I think, whoa, hang on a sec. What did I get rid of exactly? Uh, so, yeah, I guess it's a, a good and bad what I did to myself. Hmm. Yeah. Joanne, oh, you want oh. to sing something well, long, that, yeah? That kind of resonates with me because uh, my formative years, I was actually very ashamed to be Chinese. It was part of being that local-born got to assimilate into the white culture as much as possible because of the conditioning that my parents had. And and being wanting to be more white than Chinese, wanted to relegate anything of my culture, local born Chinese culture. And then uh, getting past through all that and then later on in life, having a stronger awareness of my culture and heritage and wanting to learn how to speak Cantonese instead of having to. And then we get this guy here coming from Hong Kong mm -hmm. who speaks Cantonese, but he, try, he, he chose to try his best to learn to speak English, not much so much to assimilate, but also not so much assimilation, but communication. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it with Derek. Mm -hmm. And so it's learning about being Chinese from different aspects, from my aspect, and from Derek, from Derek share as well. So, anyway, that just resonated with me. No, I have no idea where that came <laughs> from. We, when we're talking about the play, um, which Derek tried to train me. Let me see if I can say it in Cantonese. Six Jin Chin Ha, yep, something like that. Um, when you're talking about having it in Cantonese. Did you know, Giovanni, did, how did you feel it went? Like, do you feel, what works about it, what doesn't work, if you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, <coughs> when, in, in practice, I think, laughs land in slightly different places, but not totally different. So, so it was partially kind of a different experience. Um, is it fair to say? I mean, I, I, I think, because our audiences were real, really, really split mix between Chinese speakers and non-Chinese speakers, and it seemed to land best with people who were like second generation bilingual and primarily English speakers. I think people who were um, older, sometimes I don't know if the irony of the piece, what, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I have a similar feeling too. Yeah, because yeah. the piece, it's, it's, it's a satirical piece, right? And, and I don't, I mean, I don't know enough about Cantonese, but I don't know if that strain of very, um, like, you know, it's, in, in, it's influences are things like the Colbert Report. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, 
full frontal, that kind of sense of satire. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if it translated as well. So. Yeah, and that's one thing that we've uh, we've tried to work through uh, in the translation process to, uh, in terms of sentence structures and how how and when the jokes land in in the two different languages, just because how words have to be, in in, in particular orders. Um, but yeah, the the satirical aspect, uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I thought Derek did an amazing job. Like, I mean, the fact that that I'd say ninety percent of the laughs landed in the exact same spot you'd expect them to is a real testament to the, the strength of his translation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And to the content. The yeah. content must must get must be received in a similar way, I, I I'm guessing. I mean I don't know. I <laughs> I don't speak Cantonese, so I was reading the subtitles, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to ask Derek this question, but I'm going to ask you too, because you're talking about um, talk, uh, speaking Cantonese in, in, in um, King of Louise, and I was wondering if you are different in Cantonese than you are in English. Well, yeah, my, I, like my Cantonese is okay. It, it was sort of a, a weird thing. I'm, my first language is actually Cantonese, and I was apparently fluent when I was a kid. And then kind of similar maybe to Bob's experience as I was growing up, there's a lot of messaging of like, okay, speak English now, we're in English spaces. And I lost it. So now I call, I say I have restaurant Cantonese. <laughs> I do okay in like the Hong Kong cafes and stuff, but outside of that, it's, it's not great. But I, I do feel I think, like I remember going back to Hong Kong and then basically having being forced to speak Cantonese. And it, I don't know how to say it, but like your thinking changes in a way. Um, and I don't know how to explain it, but um, the way that you think, and to a certain degree, even the way that you perceive the world um, changes, something in your brain kind of happens. And um, yeah, and oh, I'll, I'll add a, as well as I learned in theater school, um, this weird thing happens is I speak English with the muscles that you use to speak Cantonese. So they had to actually eliminate and try to work on that because it was it was actually messing up a lot of my speech, but they, they realized that and um, I had to sort of learn vocal exercises to, mm. to open up to the thing. Derek, uh, you were nodding too. Yeah, what, I, what comes to mind for me, it's all in the tones. When it comes more. to Cantonese, well, <laughs> can I? I mean, like, yes. yeah. the standard example of me going to a restaurant when I was a kid, the term for waiter is forge, and I called him forge, <laughs> which is turkey. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a question of being, to me, when it comes to any language, it's the tones, especially Mandarin and Cantonese. So you just got to be careful what you say. Um, yeah, that's why I find uh, it's all in the tones. Um, no more, no less. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a different performer in English than you are in in, in Cantonese, I think. In yeah, I think I am. I I often I I feel like I am. Um, <coughs> I think I'm more in my body when I'm performing in Cantonese. Uh, I think less. I definitely think less when I'm performing in Cantonese, and uh, because A Taste of Empire has so many moments uh, of bantering and, and joking with the audience, and I find doing that in Cantonese so much easier. Mm. Yeah, it's it's it, it all comes more from, yeah. And, mm. and I feel, and I make, the jokes I make are, are very different in Cantonese and, and in English. Um, in Cantonese, they they tend to be a little more crass and and <laughs> um, I guess childish. I mean, it kind of makes sense because uh, it's the language that I've been speaking since I was a kid, and you know, um, sixteen, I was still making really terrible crap jokes. <laughs> yeah, well, and you were and sixteen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I I also resonate with Andrea's story about in um, uh, performance class, uh, um, uh, your voice teacher 
working with the way you speak in English and yeah. <coughs> well, removing your voice removes your personality, really, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I also remember. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I also remember uh, my dream switching languages from, uh, from Cantonese to English. Um, and then when I was doing Tales of Empire, it uh, kind of popped in a little bit, Cantonese, and but <laughs> now it's kind of gone again. Yeah. Uh, Bob, while I was doing a little work on this, thinking about this panel, I was uh, floating along on the internet and found this, well, two separate um, sites called Underwater Chinatown. And one of them is a storytelling site, and you're involved in that. Can you talk a little bit about that? That was last January. Um, it was a workshop done at the UBC Learning Center, and it was an audio. So it was my first time I ever done anything audio, and I collaborated with uh, Liz Chung. And basically, we decided to have an audio about dumpling making. In fact, <laughs> it should have been done here. I should have brought it down today, whatever. But, <laughs> but um, this this underwater audio was 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 quite something. We got into it and getting into the ingredients, talking about s talking story pertaining to food, and what we did with it. Liz and I compared our different notes with different family functions and everything. So uh, it was really funny. I was just reminiscing about. This is remind me of the Friday nights at home, the kitchen table, making dumplings and talking with family. And that's basically what that underwater uh, Chinatown. Chinatown did, was bring back that reminiscence of, of being with the family and preparing food. We're going, um, hmm? okay. We're going to put um, that up on our website. It's underwaterchinatown.wordpress.com slash story. And uh, there's also a, a neat interactive site that displays archives related to three different Chinese theaters or opera houses in Chinatown. So if you just Google underwater Chinatown, you're going to get those things. Yeah. Can, do you know anything about those um, opera houses or theaters? Or are they part of your tour? No, not part of my tour. I, I, I'm more culinary and cultural. Uh, there was a, a, an opera house there called Hearts Opera House at one time, and that was on Carroll Street. I know there was another opera house on Shanghai Alley, but um, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. that were I the think two. There were at least three. Three. There was three opera houses. Yeah. Well, there are three that yeah. are on that. Um, Um, if, um, I'd just like to ask each one of you to just weigh in uh, for a minute about if, if you think that there are ways for us to create more cultural space in Vancouver for, for Cantonese language theater. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, that, that's what we're really trying very hard to do at Gateway in Richmond is to, to create a space for not just works that are uh, presented from overseas, which we have done, but also original Canadian voices, um, you know, like what Derek did. And, and, and I think the two have to, to definitely be part and parcel of it, you know, bringing uh, voices from abroad so that you have that kind of international exchange, yeah. but also, you know, uh, Supporting something that would be almost like a, a Chinese version of Théâtre La Seizième, where you have uh, people, um, you know, as well as having a French language theater in China, we have definitely definitely have room for Cantonese and Mandarin language theater in the Lower Mainland. Yeah. I think what would also help is to uh, to say also include 
or, or, or invite audience members who don't speak Cantonese to those performances, and uh, just to, just to show that we just to show that we're not only doing Cantonese shows for Cantonese people and English shows for for English speaking people, because I, I don't think that's the way to go. Um, I, I think there's something in theater that brings people together and, yeah. and not to separate us into different groups. And uh, so what what we did with the I thought I thought that was a really helpful device to have uh, Chinese and English uh, stage writers. And yeah, I remember because I, I worked for Gateway during uh, last year's Pacific Festival. And I guess just to add on to that is that there is actually a real demand for Cantonese language theater. I know a lot of times um, in the theater conversation, there's an assumption that, you know, um, like Chinese people aren't interested in the arts and aren't interested in the theater, and it's not that. It was it's more so there isn't um, the art that is that's catered to them, mm -hmm. or that well, or not just <coughs> necessarily catered, but welcomes them as well. So, what was really beautiful about the Pacific Festival was seeing so many people and having um, like wait lists, people waiting yeah. to go see art, and it was so beautiful. But also um, having those the English surtitles, which yeah. really gave this message that everyone. Is welcome. So, do you have anything to add, Paul? Yeah, I think we all learn from each other, and I think that's the important issue. And I really think, you know, Taste of Empire. It just it re comes to mind. Like I was, I was invited to go down to San Francisco for some Chinese opera, and it was at the opera, at the opera hall, and and they actually had Chinese opera with English subtitles. So just to give people non Asian, non Chinese the awareness of Chinese opera is just not all clang, 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 clang. There's a meaning behind it and people can then understand it. Mm -hmm. So we all learn from each other and I, I really think that was pretty cool, English subtitles right there. Well, it's not like we haven't been doing <coughs> opera in Italian and we don't all speak Italian. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to open this up to the audience and, and is, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. So we um, after after we had that initial conversation, uh, I kind of went away and, and made an early draft, and then and then uh, on the recommendation of uh, of PPC, uh, Heidi and Kathleen, uh, they suggested that we apply for a translation residency uh, hosted by Playwrights Workshop Montreal in a little place called Tabasac in, um, in in Quebec. So there we spent ten. Ten days. Ten days, yeah, uh, uh, focusing on this particular piece. So in the morning, we would uh, uh, I would read 
a bit out loud, and then Giovanni would read a bit out loud, and then we would kind of discuss, oh, is the is the pace and the rhythm kind of matching? Are we are we saying the same thing here? And yeah, yeah, and also just um, I'd go line by line and and maybe um, talk about things that weren't evident on a on a first read or even a second read. For example, like um, certain sentence structures, like something that happened at the very end of the play. I would tell Derek. However you translate it, it's really important that there's a parallel between this and this because this is a callback to that. Mm-hmm. Or there's there's a line where he says, you know, it's just a really it's a really silly thing where he says, letting all the goodness of the earth and letting it g- the bounties trickle down. Mm-hmm. And I asked him, trickle down is like um, a reference to trickle down economics. Mm-hmm. So can we use the same Cantonese translation that you'd use for Milton Friedman's principle of trickle down economics? Just little nuances like that. So, so you know, like, and, and I'd ask, you know, I wouldn't presume it would work as a, you know, but I'd say, does the, however, the yeah. term, the determined Cantonese for trickle down economics work, and you know, just little things like that, that, that again aren't really evident. So he, really, it's just a way of letting him inside my brain of what I was thinking when I wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> trickle down economics. <laughs> I think it's translated as uh, I think it's a straight, uh, direct <coughs> translation. Um, uh, probably thick like Geng Zai, but then uh, trickle down. So and then you say Hen Hao Dick Lai. So you know, like trickle down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the English one's being published in. Um, the spring of 2017. Yeah, really? yeah. I'm sorry, I should oh, say. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by um, Talon Books. But, but yeah, you know, it's funny. Maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, we should just have that I'd side. S- yeah, I was yeah. talking to Anne Marie at, yeah. at the opening. I said, I don't know why you don't just put both of them in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, that us- that tends to happen in in my writing. Uh, uh, I yeah, when I write plays, I tend to explore those darker places than when I well, so far than when I work in Cantonese. Um, but uh, I've also been told that I don't move like a uh, Hong Kong Chinese person or something like that. <laughs> that I move like a comedian. <laughs> what does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no 